all-new Dr. Phil. I don't think that I'm a cold-blooded murderer. A wealthy New York socialite accused of poisoning her son. When you checked in to the Peninsula Hotel, did you believe he knew, this is my death house? She claimed she killed him. I was to protect him. To save him from alleged abuse. You had money, you had means, passports, why not run? That sounded crazy to me. But ending your child's life does not sound crazy to you? From behind bars on Rikers Island. Did you get on top of your son and force feed him to feel cool. the exclusive interview? The only eyewitness you killed. Who gave you the right to end this child's life? Now, from New York City, here's Dr. Phil. Today, an exclusive interview behind bars with the multi-millionaire Manhattan socialite accused of the unthinkable, murdering her own eight-year-old son. Former high-powered pharmaceutical executive Gigi Jordan says this was a murder-suicide gone wrong and claims she only killed her son to protect him. Gigi admits she checked into a ritzy hotel on Fifth Avenue armed with nearly 6,000 prescription pills and poisoned her son with a lethal combination of Ambien and Xanax washing down the pills using a syringe full of expensive vodka, orange juice, and crushed up hydrocodone. Gigi is on trial for murder right now in New York City. Outside the Posh Peninsula, the body of an eight-year-old boy was taken away after police believe he was forced at a deadly mix of pills by his mother. Did mommy actually grind down powerful painkillers, Vicodin, to mix with vodka and orange juice, then force feed her little eight-year-old son? Police race to a $2,000 a night hotel suite. There they find an executive mom, Gigi Jordan sitting on the floor. Police forced their way into the 16th floor room where inside they found a suicide note, the boy's lifeless body on the bed, and his mother slumped nearby, babbling incoherently. The deadly discovery came after the woman emailed family in her native Belgium saying she was planning to kill herself and her son. The little boy, by all accounts, according to his teachers, a mute. He couldn't scream out or complain. Jordan claims the boy's father had been sexually abusing him, and she believes she was saving him from a life of torture. Prosecutors describe the mercy killing defense as hollow. In court papers, Carrie O'Connell, the lead prosecutor, wrote, while the defendant has a right to a defense, she does not get to simply conjure one from the ether. Today, one of Jordan's attorneys, Ron Kuby, demanded a mistrial because he said the judge did not allow the jurors to hear evidence that might have proved Jordan's ex husband, Ray Mira, was trying to kill her, which led to her emotional instability. All I can tell you is that Gigi has, has a story to tell um, of how this unfolded and what happened to her and what happened to Jude, and she's going to tell that story. Gigi Jordan says she planned to kill herself and her son because she believed her ex-husband Ray had mafia ties and planned to kill her. Gigi says if she died, she was terrified custody of Jude would go to his biological father. A man Gigi claims abused the boy. The allegations Gigi Jordan has made are absolutely refuted by both of her ex-husbands. And neither man has ever been charged with any crime. Across the water is Rikers Island, home to one of New York's most notorious correctional facilities. Inside, Gigi Jordan is awaiting her fate. Let's talk about what happened and why you're on trial. I've studied your website, ggjordantruth.com. On February 3rd of 2010, you took your son, Jude, eight years old, and you checked into the Peninsula Hotel, correct? Correct. Sometime over the next 48 hours, you took his life. Yes, I gave him um, medication that resulted in his death. You killed your son? Yes. And you did so intentionally? Yes. You also sought to take your own life? Yes. By taking these pills, these medications? Correct. We're going to talk about why in a minute. You're riding up the elevator to the 16th floor. What are you thinking? 
I'm not thinking. I'm terrified. As you walked through that door, did you know you were going to go into that room and kill that boy and yourself? Up until the moment that happened, I had continuing reservations. What was his demeanor when you went into the room? Was he excited to be there? Was it, you know, it's a beautiful place. Was he running around the room? Was he jumping on the bed? Was he happy? Was he... He was very anxious. At some point in that room, you crossed the line and said, I'm doing this. I said, I haven't been able to protect this child from this horror his whole life. I didn't want him to be here, and I certainly didn't want to be here without him. I have typing between us, back and forth and back and forth, leading up to that moment. And he had the capacity to have an intelligent discussion with you. I understand it was typing. Yes. But he had the, the conceptual ability to have this conversation with you. Yes. Did he know why you were taking him to the peninsula? He knew. We had been talking about this for approximately three days. When you walked through the doors of the peninsula, you believed he knew this is my death house. No, I don't know that he knew this was his death house. This was something that we were discussing back and forth, back and forth. He would say things to me like, you're too weak. You know this is the only way out. They're going to get me. They're going to get you. So up until the very end, there was back and forth about whether or not this was the only way out. Did Jude encourage you to take his life? Jude and I talked a lot in the prior days about the ongoing threats to my life and what would happen to him and his fears that he had been expressing over a couple of years, over the time that I was able to separate him from his biological father, who had horrendously sexually abused him for the earlier course of his life, up till he was six and a half years old, when he found the courage to tell me about the abuse. I had assured him 50, 60 times a day in response to his terror, he'll find me, he'll kill me. He's going to kidnap me and take me. He's going to get me. If he finds out I've told, he's going to get me. So where was he when you gave him the first medication, and what did you say? I didn't say anything. Jude, Jude at that point, understood. He took med He'd been taking medications for most of his life. He understood what was going on. So you handed him some pills to take? Yes. How many at one time? I don't know. I would hand him six or seven pills. And he could swallow them? Yes. Did he know what you were giving him? I don't know that he specifically knew. He may have. He was used to these medications. He knew about some of them. This is what happened, Dr. Phil. Did he know when you put those pills in his hand? Did he know this is it? I think so. We're doing this? Yes. And you gave him about 50 pills? Something like that. 15 or 20 Xanax and 30 or 40 Ambien? Yes. You also say that you crushed up some pills because they had hard edges on them and it was difficult for him to swallow. They were large pills, hydrocodone, and they were this big and they needed to be split and crushed. Was a syringe ever used? Yes, he'd been taking medication and syringes from years prior. How long did it take for him to take all of those? Five or ten minutes. He... Did he type anything during that time? Did he yes. say, is this it? He said, you're too chicken to do this, but they're going to get us. It's the only way out. <sighs> did you feel like he was goading you into it? No. But he wanted you to do it? Yes. Was he afraid? I don't think he was afraid. I think he was afraid of being alive. So you believe once he got in that room and you started giving him the pills, you think he knew? Yes. Did he hug you? Did he... Yes. Did he hold on to you in those final moments? 
we held each other in the end. We held each other. Once he took the pills, I held him and he held me. And he said, he said, God will forgive you. He knows everything that you've done to try to help me. He typed that out. And how long before he lost consciousness? He, he was asleep and then maybe 15 minutes, 20 minutes. And how long before your son died? I don't know. Right now it isn't clear, but they think they say it was like 24 hours, something like that. There is speculation that he fought you, that he did not want to take the pills, and that you jammed him down his throat, that you used the syringe, that he was bruised on his nose and his mouth and his chin. Did you get on top of your son and sit on his chest and force feed him these medicines? Jude Mira's biological father, Emil Chekhov, vehemently denies all the accusations G.G. Jordan makes against him. We reached out to him to offer the opportunity to participate in the show and tell his side of the story. We did not hear back from him in time for our broadcast deadline. Emil Chekhov has not been charged with any crime. I just don't get how it is rational, even under the pressure you were at the time, to not do everything else first before you did what you did. Who gave you the right to end this child's life? Monday on an all-new Dr. Phil. A tragic death. The police ruled that this was a suicide. But the mother says murder. My daughter, she was killed. It's making national headlines. He had a Okay, okay, okay stop, hold on, hold on. And dividing a family. They refused to accept this as a suicide. You heard your daughter ask her brother, Scott, to help her. Absolutely not. You know you said that, Scott. You can't deny it. Monday. Then on Tuesday, three beautiful daughters. You three are high right now, right? All heroin addicts. We get high together. I want to burn our house down because it's evil. What the hell is this? Awesome. That's Tuesday. We now return to Dr. Phil's an interview with New York socialite Gigi Jordan. Gigi Jordan testified that after checking in to the Peninsula Hotel, she fed her son 50 pills. Fifteen minutes after Jude swallowed his final capsule, Gigi says he, quote, fell asleep on the bed. But prosecutors claim bruises on Jude's nose, chin, and chest indicate that she got on top of her son and force-fed him the poisonous mix of pills and also used a syringe to give him liquefied hydrocodone. She insists she panicked when she realized her son was dying and the bruises are a result of her frantic efforts to revive him. There is speculation that he fought you, that he did not want to take the pills and that you jammed him down his throat, that he was bruised on his nose and his mouth and his chin because you had to force his mouth open and hold his nose to make him swallow. No. We had a forensic pathologist testify that the bruises on his chest, his nose, and his chin were related to the CPR that I attempted to administer at the end when I heard his, it's called agonal breathing, which is when you know that someone's really at the end and dying. But you wanted him to die. You, you wanted him to be Dr. safe. Phil, it's not that simple, you know. It's really not that simple. It's the last thing I wanted. I wanted him to be safe. These words kill, death house. I wanted him to be safe. I didn't want him to be raped or tortured anymore. I did not, the last thing in the world I wanted was to lose my son. My son was my whole life. He's still my whole life. He's the reason I'm here telling you this story. <laughs> When did you take the pills that were to kill you? He took the pills late that night, you know, 12 midnight, something like that. And then he passed, I don't know, sometime on the 4th. And then I wrote a 20 some odd page suicide note telling, trying to tell everything that had happened. 
and that suicide note was sealed and not admitted by the court in my trial. Your website is ggjordantruth.com. I owed it to you to learn and study what did not get into that court. So you check in at 8 p.m. on the 3rd, so early morning of the 4th, somewhere in there, you give him this fatal overdose. The next morning, you're still there. You, you haven't taken any medication, and you're working on this suicide I'm writing letter. the suicide note, yes. Okay. There's evidence that you had someone from the front desk come mail two letters. Yes. I wrote a check for $8 million to Doctors Without Borders, and I wrote a check for $12 million to the American Cross Haitian Relief Fund. So while you're writing these checks, you're in the room, and Jude has passed. He was unconscious, but he was still alive. Did you think, I need to stop this? I need to get him help? Did you question yourself? I questioned myself when I heard him get breathing, when I heard the agonal breaths. That's when I, it's not a matter of questioning. I just had to run and try to help him. I couldn't stand it. I thought he was gone. Okay. So when you tried to help him and could not, you remained in the room with him for quite some time. This is a recent picture with you in bed with your son. Were you in bed with him much like this? Yes. And he, he looks very happy and peaceful with you at this point. Was he that way when you were with him that night? At times, towards the end, he was. He was very anxious for days and days leading up to this. Uh -huh. If I can show you another picture, it ended very, very differently. This is him taking him on a gurney outside the hotel. So at some point, you took the medications to end your life. Yes. And when you took them, you knew Jude was gone. It was okay for you to go. Yes. You're a nurse. You had lots of medicines there. Why did you fail? Dr. Phil, I took over 60 milligrams of Xanax. Okay. I took over 50 milligrams of Ambien. I took 10 hydrocodone and I drank vodka. When I sent the email was finished, I sent it to numerous people. I sent it to attorneys I had reached out to to help me. I sent it to law enforcement. I sent it to family members. One of my family members called the police. The police came, but I'm told by one of, one of the detectives who testified that I was screaming, retching, vomiting. And the other officer, there's a tape recording where he says she's barely alive. I assume that I, because I was found, early enough that that's the reason I didn't die. As you sit here today, did you do the right thing? Would you do it again? You believed you were going to be killed and that your killer was going to make certain that your son got returned to this person that you believe was monstrously torturing and molesting this innocent child. I hate my grandpa. I hate what he did. You say he molested you in the bed with your grandmother. My grandmother doesn't want to admit that she knew. What do you want? You want, I'm sorry? I I'm want... sorry for what? I didn't see anything, but I'll be damned if I can stand out here and listen to your lies. My daughters are our heroin users. We get high together. We shoot off six, seven times a day. This is your home, Dad. They beat me down. Then grow a pair and be a man. All the drama. I want to burn our frickin' house down because it's evil. It's not the house, it's us. All the emotion. Tell him what you want him to know. I just want you to be in my life. All happens this November. If you walk off this stage, our relationship is done. On Dr. Phil.
now return to Death on Fifth Avenue. Millionaire mom accused of murdering her son speaks from Rikers Island. Jude Mira spent his final hours alive right here at the Peninsula Hotel. While Manhattan's elite socialized downstairs, prosecutors say G.G. Jordan had nearly 6,000 prescription pills and a syringe used to force feed patients and a plan to check out alone. As you sit here today, did you do the right thing? Would you do it again? When you cheer for someone's life and you cheer for your own life. I don't know. Could I have tried more things? I tried so many things. You know, and what I know now, I don't know. I certainly did not want my son gone. Certainly didn't want to be here without him and love him more than anything in the world. <laughs> you turn my head. Was this a mercy? Killing? Mercy killing says to me, someone's suffering and you just want to put them out of their misery in some way. That's not what this was. What was it? This was the most hopeful time in his life. I'd gotten him into a regular school where he was being mainstreamed. They'd put him in the fifth and sixth grade combined class when he was eight years old. He had friends. I couldn't believe that someone who'd been through what he'd been through had the hope that he had about life. This had nothing to do with that. It was to protect him. Your website is ggjordantruth.com, and then you have headings, The Inadmissible Truth. And yes. in it, you talk about systematic torture of Jude Mira, inadmissible. June's own words about the torment he suffered, inadmissible. You detail in here what you say he reported to you and others about horrific systematic torture and sexual molestation humiliation degradation yes and your position is that you believed you were going to be killed and that your killer was going to make certain that your son got returned to this person that you believe was monstrously torturing and molesting this innocent child. Yes. And for that reason, you said our only way out is death. Having tried every imaginable avenue possible, but did, did you run? I made efforts starting as early as 2008 when I started to understand some of these things about Mira and the danger he posed. But you never reported it to the authorities. I did report it to the authorities. You filed complaints with yes, the police. Yes, my three different therapists filed it with Child Protective Services. No, them at you. I went through the therapist. If somebody is hurting your child, you call the police, you call 911, you, you, you call the cops. I did not believe that the police and I was told by, through my therapist that they wouldn't believe it, they didn't believe it, and that they wouldn't make a police report because the police would never prosecute this. He can sit with an investigator and type out what he's saying to you, correct? I'm just telling you what I was told. No, I'm just asking, could he do that? I eventually did go to law enforcement. I went to Wyoming, Dr. Phil. They didn't believe me. They didn't believe him mm -hmm. because he was terrified. They propped him up on a medical table and said type type about the abuse mm -hmm. and when he didn't and when he was afraid and he withdrew his hand they said oh this is made up this isn't true but what i'm saying is did you do everything you could do short of ending that child's life you had money you had means you had passports you had unfettered custody and control why not run now return to Death on Fifth Avenue. A mercy killing defense, a sane mother viewing death as a reasonable option for her child followed by what was supposed to be a suicide. As a mother who loved her child, she engaged in what is called 
altruistic suicide filicide. Jordan and her lawyers alleging the boy's biological father abused the boy sexually and was a constant threat, although he denies it and is not charged with any crime. Let's assume for argument's sake that what he reported to you was true. We, we don't know that because you, you never saw it happen. All, all you know is what not. he told you. I saw the corroboration of many things that he told me. The problem that we face today is the only eyewitness you killed. No, that's not true. I have people that he typed with independently about the abuse. That's how he communicated. Dr. Frank Putnam is a psychiatrist and a professor of psychiatry at the University of North Carolina School of Medicine. He did not testify at Gigi's trial, and although he never met the child, Dr. Putnam has reviewed Jude's medical records and the messages Gigi says the special needs son typed on a Blackberry about his alleged abuse. Here's what he had to say. Jude had very little spoken language, but he had very good keyboarding skills. And this was noted in the record by a number of physicians, and it's documented that he was able to uh, type on a computer and even type on a Blackberry at times. And he used these to communicate with his mother, he used this to communicate with his therapist, he used this to communicate with his teachers in school, with his classmates. There are many examples of Jude being able to actually write on a little Blackberry. Jude was able to communicate what happened to him using the texting. I've seen this kind of texting with a number of children now, and I'm quite struck, even though they may not be able to speak, and many people assume that they must be in some ways mentally retarded or challenged, that they often can text at very high levels of language. I read hundreds of pages of Jude's text. Much of it is just very simple stuff about what he wants for breakfast or what he wants to do or what he doesn't want to do. But he has very poignant passages where he's talking to teachers, to his mother, about how he feels. This is not so unusual. I've seen other children who use now primarily tablets to text. There are many children out there who cannot speak but are actually able to communicate fairly well using a tablet or a, some kind of a keyboard device. I made attempts to make legitimate reports to CPS, the FBI, the U.S. Attorney's Office. No one did anything. No one believed me or Jude. And I had a lawyer get me an expert on how to disappear. He said, get, a, get several suitcases and get cash and go to the Bahamas. And why did you not do that? Dr. Phil, that sounded crazy to me. That sounds crazy to you, but ending your child's life does not sound crazy to you? Sounds crazy to me that I should have to be and he should have to be in a position where no one would believe or help us. The craziest sounding thing of all is, is ending a child's life before you have exercised every potential option, right? If one option is take cash and go live on the beach in the Bahamas, isn't that better? Do you better? think that me alone in the Bahamas with an eight-year-old child with tremendous needs educationally, therapy-wise, medical needs, do you think that a guy who's associated with a mafia who wants me dead isn't going to find me? This isn't just a guy who was pissed off oh, and people have killed that. for a lot less money. He has denied that. He has never been charged. What would he say? Of course he would deny it, but, he, but company, he's never been charged. His company, Allion Healthcare, was indicted. But he was not. You had money, you had means, you had passports, you had unfettered custody and control. Why not run? To run would make me only more vulnerable. But how does that make sense if the alternative is to end your child's life? I equate it to battered women's syndrome. When someone has been harassing you, stalking you, terrifying you, abusing your child, there comes a point when you ask me, would you do it differently? Ask a battered woman that. Why not institutionalize him under an assumed name somewhere with high security that they can't get to? I don't want my son in an institution. You said he was, he had friends, he was hopeful, he was happy, and it's that time that you choose that option? I felt completely incapable of protecting him. That's all that I can tell you. Whether that was rational or not, I can't say, but I don't think that I'm a cold-blooded murderer. We reached out to Ray Mira and invited him and his attorney to appear on the show. His attorney, Ray Raskoff, provided us with this statement. 
Mr. Mirror has received multiple requests from the media for information concerning the Gigi Jordan trial. Mr. Mirror remains deeply saddened by the tragedy of Jude's death and regrets the need to again deny the false and the irrational allegations that Miss Jordan has made against him. I just don't get how it is rational to not do everything else first before you did what you did. Who gave you the right to end this child's life? Monday on an all-new Dr. Phil. Her daughter's death has divided their family. This is a suicide. They refuse to accept that. If this was a homicide, you want to know it, don't you? Absolutely, but it's not. Well, you don't know that. That's Monday. Now, I want to be very clear. Your position is you did not do what you did because this was a special needs child. No. You did not do this because he was a burden. No. You did not do this because you are a wealthy New York socialite that wanted to flit about Manhattan. Yeah. Does that make sense, Because i got to tell you what I think. I don't think you had the right to end this child's life. I don't think it was rational. I don't think it was reasonable. I don't think you have the right to take a child and end their life because your assessment is that things are going to get bad for them. I just don't get how it is rational, even under the pressure you were at the time, to not do everything else first before you did what you did. Why you didn't run? Why you didn't put him in an institution? Who gave you the right to end this child's life? I can't tell you about who has the right. All I can tell you is it's, it's easy to judge. It's easy to sit there and not put yourself in someone else's shoes. Do you advocate this? No. No. I mean, there, because there are people in analogous it's situations it's out easy. there. It's easy to say, how ridiculous is that? She, I wanted to do this and go on and live my socialite life. Really? It's wrong. It's wrong. I wish I would have died with him that night. That's all I can Since tell you. Since you didn't, should you go to jail? I probably will. And the fact that despite what you say or think, I feel I tried and went above and beyond in every possible manner to get help. And the fact of my inability to do that tremendously added to the burden and the fears. They took him away from me. When I reported this in Wyoming, they took him out of my custody. But were they right? I mean, they were saying, this lady is unstable. We need to protect this child from her. And as it turns out, you ended his life. Were they not prophetic in saying they I should take that child from you? I'm not defending what I did. It's I'm defending what happened to him and the lack of the system and the society, despite my efforts that you say may have been inadequate to do anything to help us. Had I died that night, not everyone would be sympathetic, but people would just feel this was generally a tragedy. It would be okay if I died, okay? So the exclusion of all the evidence about my suicide attempt is very, very important. The last thing I want to say is ask Jude how he feels about me. Think about Jude right now looking down. Who knows what he went through and what I went through to try to protect him. How his voice couldn't be heard how my voice trying to protect him couldn't be heard and ask him what he feels about me and who I was and what I tried to do and what should happen to me. But Gigi, you were winning. He started yeah. telling you this at age six. You know for that two years, you know he Year had been hurt. You were winning. That was 25% of his life and you chose that time to end his life. Whether I cracked under the pressure, whether there was other things I could have done, I felt it was like a ticking time bomb. All I know is under the fears and the pressures and what he had gone through and what I had gone through trying to help him and protect him. Okay, look at this video for me. This is letter. Yay, yay. Up, down, up, down. You can do the big one. I saw two different videos of Jude. Many autistic children do not relate directly to people. Jude was very related. How did you so fast, Jude? 
He was very involved and related. He made good eye contact with people. He listened to people. He watched people. If people were talking about him, he knew that and would smile when they said his name. He was very interactive with adults. He listened to adult conversations. We don't see that in classically in autistic children. Well, Jude was seen all over the country in the hopes that some expert could find out what was the matter with him. Gigi was taking her child from hospital to hospital. She was consulting the best specialists. She was doing everything a parent could do. Jude received many, many extensive medical workups. He received uh, very extensive kinds of testing, both for his autism and for his medical conditions. He really got the million dollar workup. This precious, Precious boy. Yeah, I really wanted him to die, Dr. Phil. You can see that from our interaction, right? You can see that this is someone I didn't love and care for more than anything. It's very obvious. I wanted him dead. I didn't want him in a home where someone else could watch him because I didn't care about him. I know I wanted him to die. That's what that film tells you, right? I asked you in the beginning, if you had this to do over, would you end his life again? I would have done a better job of making sure I ended my own. That's what I would have done. That's what I would have done. This is the second tragic story that we have covered this year where a mother chose to kill her special needs child if you are a parent of a special needs child, you need to know, no matter what the circumstances, you do not have the right or the moral empowerment to make the decision to end a child's life. There is always a better choice. Now, if you are a family coping with autism and you need support, you can go to AutismSpeaks.org. You can also go to AutismNow.org. This case is complicated because this child was seen for a particular mysterious condition that one had to go through hundreds and hundreds of pages of medical records, hundreds and hundreds of pages of therapy notes, as well as the texting to unravel what was happening. Every doctor who saw Jude indicated that he was an atypical case. No one really could figure out what was the matter with him. Jude was thought to have autism because he had some of the classic signs of regression of language early in life. But there were many atypical features that people noticed. So Jude had good receptive language, meaning that he could hear what people said, he could understand what people said. There are many examples in the record where people explained very complicated things to him. He understood, he was able to comply with their instructions, he was able to do things. What he couldn't do was express himself very well. He had very few words initially. He could just say a very few kind of da, ba, da type words. So he had what we call good receptive language, meaning that he could hear and understand but he had poor expressive language, meaning that he couldn't talk very well and ex make himself known. One of the reasons that people did not see Jude as having a classic case of autism is that he showed uh, dramatic improvements for a variety of different treatments that don't work for autism. For example, uh, drugs like Valium, uh, electroconvulsive shock, uh, steroids. In each of these cases, he showed a transient or a short-lived but very dramatic improvement where he was almost normal. He received a diagnosis called autism spectrum disorder, suggesting that he was somewhere in this category of autism, but that he did not have the usual features. If you look in the medical record, you see in addition to the workup for his autism, he was having many weird things happening to him. Jude had difficulty urinating, but he never actually had urinary tract infections, and no one could understand what these difficulties were due to. When they were working up one of Jude's urinary tract infections, or apparent infections, which they, they found that he had very high levels of a stress hormone called adrenaline. 
And these levels were so high that they thought that he had a tumor of the adrenal gland. And so he underwent a very extensive workup at several hospitals uh, to look for a tumor, and no tumor was found. There was no explanation for these sky-high levels, which were documented in several hospital laboratories. And we find that this is one of the hormones that gets raised uh, in uh, at very high levels as a result of stress. Out of all the cases I've done, this is the most complicated case I've ever seen. This is an enormously tangled web in which you have to look at the forest and not the trees. I'll set the alarm, and when it's over, it's over. I looked at the case as if it were a Munchausen's case. I would say that there are a number of things that make me think that this was not being done by Gigi. One is that she gave very clear uh, histories and physicals each time. She didn't distort any of the lab values. Every time she went to a new doctor, she gave a very coherent history of what the last doctor had done, what the test findings were. I went through the records looking to see how her history corresponded to what the actual medical record was, and it was spot on. What you see in those parents who bring those children to the hospital who are creating the disorder is they give you very fuzzy histories, they omit stuff. It's a very big red flag and because I can see what Dr. A did and I can see what the mother told Dr. B, I know whether she's telling Dr. B the truth about what happened with Dr. A. In every case, she was spot on. She was telling exactly what went on. She had all the lab values, she had all the x-rays. She, she knew exactly what was happening to her child. I want to point out Dr. Putnam was hired by the defense to render a professional opinion based solely on a review of the child's medical records. He never actually saw the child himself as he was retained after Jude's death. According to Dr. Putnam and Ms. Jordan, the jury was never allowed to hear Dr. Putnam's testimony or review his written opinions. I of course have no opinion of the child's communication capabilities as I never had the opportunity to meet or evaluate the child myself. The allegations Gigi Jordan has made in her court testimony and in this interview are absolutely refuted by both of her ex-husbands. I want to give a special thanks to the New York City Department of Correction and to Rikers Island Correctional Facility for their cooperation and professionalism in facilitating this interview. Thanks for watching.